Sawadikap. Hello and welcome to Daily Wisdom, Walking the Path with the Buddha. I really appreciate that you've tuned in today to learn with us because this is our Pali Canon and English study group where we study the words of the Buddha. We're in volume 5, chapters 20, I'm sorry, chapters 21 through chapters 30. In this program, what we do is we start off with a meditation in order to prepare the mind for our learning so that you can retain the teachings for longer periods of time and then actually apply them in your daily life. And then after our meditation, we'll be reading each individual chapter from our book, which is titled The First Stage of Enlightenment, Stream Enter, Volume 5. This book is comprised of teachings from the Buddha in his own words related to the first stage of enlightenment and how to progress to that stage of enlightenment. After a student will read the ch given chapter, then I'll share some teachings on that particular chapter and then open up for any questions that you guys might have. Students all over the world have been studying these and then come to class either tuning in through Zoom, Facebook, YouTube, or our podcast in order to learn the teachings of the Buddha and be able to seek guidance and understanding the detailed understanding of what the Buddha actually shared. In this book series, from volumes 2 through volume 13, we're actually studying here in this Saturday program of Pali Canon and English Study Group, The Words of the Buddha. And in this uh, latest volume, we have that collection of teachings that is all related to the first stage of enlightenment. So after you read the words of the Buddha, you'll see a reference to the original source teaching. So you can go back and perhaps see what the Buddha was saying before and or after what I've included in the book. And then you'll see an explanation from me as well. All these books are available at no cost. You can download them from our website, going to buddhadailywisdom.com and then click on the link for free books. There you'll see all the books available and you can download them from anywhere that has an internet connection. You can also take that file and go have it printed if you'd rather have a printed version. And Amazon.com has these books available as well where you can get a really nice bound book and actually have it for your collection and be able to use it at home as you study the words of the Buddha. Because as you progress in your practice of learning and practicing the Buddhist teachings on the path to enlightenment, it's really important that you base your learning and your practice in the words of the Buddha. Because it's a Buddha that awakens on their own without the guidance or help of anyone else in order to awaken to enlightenment and they discover, declare, and they are the originators of the actual path to enlightenment. So Gautama Buddha did that over 2,500 years ago. He did all the hard work for us and all we need to do is be able to learn, reflect, and practice his teachings to discover the truth for ourselves. And in doing so, we acquire wisdom. So what this program is about and our group learning program that we do on Sunday and Wednesdays, it's all about sharing the teachings so that you can learn them, but then you don't believe them. You reflect on those teachings and then you practice them in order to see the truth for yourself so that you can move the mind to this enlightened mental state where it's peaceful, calm, serene, and content with joy permanently, no longer experiencing any discontentedness. So this is why I like to thank all the students every time you join because by you working on your mind to eliminate discontentedness, you're eliminating the harms that you're causing in the world through things like your intention, speech, actions, and livelihood. And by doing that, you're experiencing a more peaceful mind and you're helping all of humanity and you're helping the world because you're not causing harm in the world. So therefore harm isn't coming back to you. This is how the mind becomes even more and more peaceful because you're not putting out harm in the world and harm isn't coming back to you. It's diminishing more and more as you get closer and closer to enlightenment. Therefore the mind becomes more and more peaceful. And you'll notice that your personal and professional relationships will really blossom. So thank you all for joining and deciding that the path to enlightenment and Gautama Buddha's teachings are something that you're dedicated to learning and you're very diligent in your practice in doing so. So let's go ahead and start with our meditation. We'll just do breathing mindfulness meditation. I won't do much guidance here because people who will typically join for this program have been meditating with me uh, in the group learning program and in their own practice for quite a while. So they don't need as much guidance. We'll just do a little bit of chanting and kind of ease into meditation and then ease out of meditation with some more chanting. 
So go ahead and make the body comfortable and then just start breathing in through the nose and out through the nose. And as you establish that breath, fixate the mind on the sound of the breath or the sensation of air moving into the nose. If you know these chants, you're welcome to join along and chant as we ease into meditation. Arahang Samma Sammoto Mahakawa Potang Mahakawanang Apiwate Ami Sawakato Mahakawata Tammo Namang Namasami Supadipano Mahakawato Sawaka Sangho Sanghang Namami Napmora Sabhakawato Arato Sama Saputasa Nap more sap hakawato Arahato Sama saputasa Nap more sap hakawato Arahato Sama saputasa Iti piso mahakawa arahang sama samuto wita cara nang samuro sekato rokawito. Anu tero purisa dama sati sata tawa manu senang puto pakewati. Just breathe in through the nose <clears throat> and out through the nose. Do this at your own pace. That's not necessarily going to sync up to the guidance that I'm providing. Breathing in and out. Fixate the mind on the breath, the sound of the breath, or sensation of air entering into the nose. Whenever the mind is off the breath, cut that off, let it go, and come back to the breath. Breathing in and out. I'm going to be quiet now so you can do this work, focusing on the breath, training the mind to let go of any thoughts, ideas, or perceptions that takes the mind off the breath. <coughs> Breathing in and out.
Wito Anu Tero Purisa Dama Sati Satatawa Manu Sanang Puto Pakawati Alright, if you guys would like to slowly make your way out of meditation, welcome to anyone who's joined us since we started our doing our meditation. We're going to move into the study of the Pali Canon in English, where we study the words of the Buddha in this book series, The Words of the Buddha. We're in volume 5, chapters 21 through 30. And as I mentioned previous to meditation, you can download this book at buddhadailywisdom.com and just click on the link or the button for the free books. And from there, you can either access the book and prepare and read for the future classes, or you can read after class. Today, we're going to be displaying all these chapters, and there's going to be a student who will read these chapters. Then I'll share some teachings around each of the chapters, and then open up for any questions that you guys might have. So I'll just turn things over to our moderators. We have Basum, Manal, and Nick that are here today, and then there's students who will be participating in the actual reading. So welcome to all of you guys, and uh, pleased to uh, study with you guys. Hi, Teacher David. I'm sorry, I don't see myself as signed as co-host. Would you be kind enough to sign? Yep. Thank you. We'll have Basim read the first chapter. Thanks, Manal. <clears throat> Six benefits in realizing the fruit of stream entry. Monks, these are the six benefits in realizing the fruit of stream entry. What six? One is fixed in the wholesome teachings. One is incapable of decline. One's discontentedness is limited. One comes to possess wisdom not shared by others. One has clearly seen causation. One has clearly seen causally arisen objects. These are the six benefits in realizing the fruit of stream entry. All right, thank you, Basim. So these are some benefits that we've talked about at different times during the program, either the group learning program or even this program, the words of the Buddha, Pali Canon and English study group. But here, instead of just my words, you can see that it actually comes from the Buddha's words as well. Here, the first one, when he talks about one is fixed in the wholesome teachings, someone who's entered the stream as a stream enterer has eliminated those first three fetters that we talked about last week which is personal existence view doubt and wrong observances and wrong behaviors these all relate to specific pollutions of mind and that second one of doubt is doubt about the buddha the teachings the community your teacher and your own ability to attain enlightenment so for someone to have removed doubt they would have already experienced a lot of benefits going through the eightfold path and developing that practice really well getting to the point where they've experienced the jhanas and they can see kind of like night and day how the condition of the mind has improved from being off the path to being on the path and on the path experiencing the jhanas you can clearly see that one's condition of the mind in your life is improving so the buddha says here one is fixed in the wholesome teachings meaning you know without a shadow of a doubt having attained the first stage of enlightenment that these are the teachings that are leading to your enlightenment and you're finally getting to the point where you're learning the truth because you're starting to see the improvements to the condition of the mind and through not believing the teachings but instead learning reflecting and practicing you're acquiring this wisdom and this wisdom is leading to more and more wholesome decisions allowing the mind to now fixate on these teachings and realize wow i've got what i need here i need to just keep pursuing this in order to continue to make my way to enlightenment so that's what he's describing here is having the benefit of eliminating doubt one is fixed in these wholesome teachings one is incapable of decline 
what he's talking about here is that someone who's entered the stream in the first stage of enlightenment is incapable of having the mind regress you won't regress from there say back to the jhanas or back even prior to the jhanas once someone moves through the jhanas and gets to that first stage of enlightenment the mind won't decline or it won't regress backwards the benefits that you're experiencing in the first stage of enlightenment they are going to exist and continue to exist and what would be wonderful is if a practitioner actually progresses past the first stage of enlightenment and then as you uh, progress through each stage of enlightenment each one of those stages you won't regress out of those stages and that's why in that first stage of enlightenment the buddha says that one will not experience any more than seven rebirths because from that point of stream entry the first stage of enlightenment there's only forward progression if you remain dedicated and diligent to your practice and don't allow complacency to set in but you surely, even if complacency sets in, you're not going to regress. So that's a really wonderful accomplishment of getting to that first stage of enlightenment so that your mind won't backslide from there in terms of moving out of that first stage of enlightenment. And from there, just continue to plot your steps, moving forward, eliminating more and more of those fetters so that you can get to enlightenment itself by eliminating all 10 fetters. The third benefit the Buddha is talking about here is that someone who's attained stream entry has seen a diminishing of discontentedness or one's discontentedness is limited. You even see that as part of the jhanas, that your discontentedness is limited to a certain extent. But getting to that first stage of enlightenment, you really start seeing the diminishing of discontentedness and it becomes more and more clear for you. And that won't regress. So you'll just continue to go forward. And as you move through each one of those stages of enlightenment, eliminating more and more of each of the 10 fetters, you'll see a more and more decline more and more limiting more and more diminishing of that discontentedness more and more where you'll have these longer and longer gaps of peacefulness calmness serenity and contentedness with joy so the discontentedness has been significantly diminished or limited and your peacefulness is expanding one comes to possess wisdom not shared by others when you attain the stage of the first stage of enlightenment as a stream enter, you will have had to have acquired certain amount of wisdom in order to get to that first stage. And this is wisdom that the average person doesn't have. So you might be out and about, you might be interacting with friends and family and observe that things that are very uh, first nature to you and just common sense to you are just such a difficult and such a struggle for others because they lack this wisdom. And this is where you can really cultivate your compassion or concern for the misfortune of others, where you see that because of their lack of wisdom, they just continue to struggle and have difficulties. And uh, if we would like to use the word suffering, they continue to suffer because of their lack of wisdom. And when you, you're experiencing this, it's important not to allow conceit or arrogance or pride to come into the mind, because that can be a tendency that can happen as you observe things that are just so simple and so easy for you because of the wisdom that you've acquired to this point sometimes the mind can become arrogant or conceited or prideful because that fetter is part of the upper fetters and the higher fetters so it doesn't get eliminated typically until you get closer to enlightenment so in this first stage of enlightenment where you're seeing so many benefits starting to come into the mind it's important to realize that you possess wisdom that is not understood by others and that you should remain compassionate rather than allow arrogance or pride or any kind of ego or conceit to come into the mind this fifth one of one has seen causality what this relates to is the natural law of gamma someone who has attained the first stage of enlightenment should be able to see the truth that it's cause and effect action and result the results of our decision that leads to every single thing that we experience in this life there's no such thing as happenstance there's no such thing as luck none of these things are actually occurring but instead what you see is that as a result of certain actions or certain causes that you have certain decisions that you make there's a certain effect or a certain result this is one who has seen causation one who has seen the cause and effect of the natural law of 
gamma. And for someone who's attained the first stage of enlightenment, you will see that more and more clearly and have seen that as what the Buddha is describing here. And then in order to continue to make your journey forward, you would just continue to learn more and more of the Buddhist teachings, seeing this causation and this natural law of gamma more and more clearly, making wiser and wiser choices as your wisdom of this natural law continues to expand and grow. <clears throat> Number six, one has clearly seen cause, cause, causally arisen objects. <laughs> Bassam had trouble with that one too causally arisen objects. What this is related to is dependent origination. This is what we were talking about last week in chapter 14 of this book, that each one of those dependently arisen objects are the causally arisen objects, that it's ignorance that leads to volitional formations, that leads to consciousness and so forth and so on, right on down the line. And for someone who is a stream answer, they will have clearly seen dependent origination. That's why it's in this book. You need to learn it. You need to understand it. And you need to be able to see it really clear as day. These 12 steps of dependent origination of one leading to the next. You wouldn't have unraveled dependent origination. That's not until the mind's actually fully enlightened that that's fully transformed. But that's why the Buddha says one has clearly seen it. Not that you've completely dismantled this dependent origination, but you actually clearly can see it. And these are six benefits that the Buddha is attributing to the fruit of stream entry or the benefits of having realized the attainment of the first stage of enlightenment referred to as stream enter or stream entry. What questions do you guys have on this chapter? There are no questions on this chapter. We'll go to Nick for chapter 22. Wonderful. Thank you, Manal. <clears throat> a stream enter is worth more than a being than being a wheel turning monarch. Monks, although a wheel turning monarch, having exercised supreme sovereign rulership over the four continents, with the breakup of the body, after death, is reborn in a good destination, in a heavenly world, in the company of heavenly beings of the heavenly realm. And there in the Nandana Grove, accompanied by an entourage of heavenly nymphs, he enjoys himself supplied and endowed with the five cores of heavenly sensual pleasure. Still, as he does not possess four things, he is not freed from hell, the animal realm, and the realm of afflicted spirits. He is not freed from the plane of misery, the bad destinations, the netherworld. Although, monks, a noble disciple maintains himself by lumps of alms food and wears rag robes, still, as he possesses four things, he is freed from hell, the animal realm, and the realm of afflicted spirits, freed from the plane of misery, bad destinations, the netherworld. What are the four? Here, monks. A noble disciple possesses confirmed confidence in the Buddha thus. The Tathagata is an arahat, perfectly enlightened, accomplished in true wisdom and conduct, fortunate, the knower of the worlds, unsurpassed leader of persons to be tamed, teacher of heavenly beings, humans, the enlightened one, the fortunate one. Number two, he possesses confirmed confidence in the teachings thus. The teachings are well expounded by a perfectly enlightened one. Directly visible, immediate, inviting one to come and see. The applicable to be personally experienced by the wise. Number three, he possesses confirmed confidence in the community thus. The community of the perfectly enlightened one's disciples is practicing the wholesome way, practicing the straight way, practicing the true way practicing the proper way. That is, the four pairs of persons, the eight types of individuals. This community of the perfectly enlightened one's disciples is worthy of gifts, worthy of hospitality, worthy of offerings, worthy of respectful salutation, the unsurpassed field of merit for the world. Number four, he possesses the virtues which are moral conduct. 
dear to the noble ones. Unbroken, untorn, unblemished, unblotched, liberating, praised by the wise, not misunderstood, and leading to concentration. He possesses these four things, and monks, between the obtaining of sovereignty over the four continents and the obtaining of the four things, the obtaining of sovereignty over the four continents is not worth a sixteenth part of the obtainings of the four things. Wonderful. Thanks, Nick. All right. So I think we've talked about this one at different times as we <clears throat> have um, progressed in this program, although I think it was a little bit, it was cast a little bit different. So let's just kind of review what a wheel turning monarchy is first, since the Buddha is saying a stream enter is worth more than this wheel turning monarch. A wheel turning monarch is a person who would be a king during the lifetime of the Buddha and who would have learned these teachings and then be ruling over their kingdom based on the teachings of the Buddha in terms of dealing with the population of people through these natural laws of existence. So practicing loving kindness and compassion and sympathetic joy and equanimity and having things like right view, right intention, right speech and other things like this. And this person would be able to essentially influence a large group of people because they are able to share these teachings through their own actions and the population of people would be kind of uh, managed or kind of uh, treated in such a way by their leader of the king that is based on these teachings. And the Buddha calls it a wheel turning monarch because this relates to the Dhamma wheel. A Buddha actually turns a Dhamma wheel when they awaken from enlightenment. The Dhamma wheel is on the flat part of a Buddha's head where the skull, the crown of the skull and the back of the head come together. There's a flat part right there that a Buddha will turn as part of their awakening. And this Dhamma wheel has eight spokes and it's a circle. So it reminds us of the Eightfold Path and the cycle of rebirth. And this turning of the Dhamma wheel is signifying the stepping forward of civilization. Because when a Buddha actually awakens to enlightenment, the teachings come into the world in a very profound way because a Buddha being self-awakened has deep profound wisdom around the teachings of the Buddha and they can now penetrate into the world to benefit all of humanity. So a Buddha awakening during that lifetime is an enormous step forward for all of civilization. So a wheel turning monarch, this wheel turning kind of relates to helping civilization go forward and the monarch is this king or this ruler who's essentially ruling over the population through these teachings and ensuring that they're kind of being a role model through these teachings but of course they're not yet in this uh, first stage of enlightenment they're not enlightened but they at least have a general understanding of the teachings of the buddha and the buddha says that you know this wheel turning monarch is not one who is done with the lower realms because a person who's in the first stage of enlightenment has eliminated all conduct that would have someone be reborn in the lower realm. So that's why the Buddha says here, a wheel turning monarch is not freed from hell, from the animal realm or from afflicted spirits, not freed from the plane of misery, the bad destinations, the netherworld, but a stream enter is. So that's why the Buddha says here, that okay as part of stream entry a stream enter would possess these four things which we've talked about at other parts of this book which is the confidence in the buddha confidence in the teachings confidence in the community and possessing the virtues or moral conduct as part of the full path and the reason why a stream enter is so beneficial as opposed to this wheel turning monarch or, or higher than a wheel turning monarch is because once somebody's attained the first stage of enlightenment, they will have the wisdom of exactly how they did that. They will never lose that wisdom, that wisdom that allowed them to attain the first stage of enlightenment. It, their mind won't regress like you heard in the previous chapters. So that wisdom will always reside in their mind. And as somebody progresses to enlightenment, the wisdom of how they actually attained enlightenment, they'll never lose that wisdom. So once someone's attained the first stage of enlightenment, not only are they experiencing the benefits of that, not only are they not causing as much harm as they once did when they were off the path, 
but they have this wisdom to now be able to share with others to allow others to be able to potentially attain that first stage of enlightenment so that's why a stream enter is so much more uh, beneficial for the world than this wheel turning monarch that the buddha is talking about what questions do you guys have on this chapter as teacher david a uh, question why is a reference to a wheel turning monarch relative to our teaching here in this chapter um it's it <coughs> appears to be um you know a path that a wheel turning monarch is uh, uh a path where um, guidance is based on a population of people and rules which guide a population of people versus a stream mentor who is training <coughs> under the teachings of the Buddha. But why is that relative to know about the real Tony Mama? Sure. So, you know, during the lifetime of the Buddha, it was the noble class and the royal family that everybody looked up to and being in the royal family it was like oh wow this is like the best thing since sliced bread so to speak right it's the the best thing someone could imagine so people would kind of hold in their mind that being a monarch must be you know really glorious and a wonderful aspiration to have and being a monarch who understands a bit of the buddhist teachings and be able to share those into the world they could influence a lot of people they could help a lot of people through their own conduct and their own decisions as being a monarch. Uh, so a wheel turning monarch would be able to help, you know, thousands and thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people uh, just through their own decisions. But their decisions would not be that of, in their influence, would not be that of a stream answer because a stream answer's wisdom would be much higher and they would be able to help a lot more people than a wheel turning monarch because to a buddha the way to help beings in the world and the way the real purpose of a buddha's existence is to help people and help as many people as are interested to learn and to be able to bring their teachings into the world in a way that will help people not only during a buddha's lifetime but long afterwards so a wheel turning monarch is helpful to a Buddha in that if they're going to learn and practice the teachings, they'll be able to influence and help a large number of people through their decisions of guiding their population through something like the teachings of a Buddha. But someone who's dedicated enough to actually attain stream entry and then have that wisdom to then be able to share with others, the Buddha is saying this person's even more valuable or more uh, beneficial, more you know worth more because they're able to actually help a lot more people because their wisdom is a lot higher even than a monarch so a monarch might have the distinction the designation the authority of being a monarch but their wisdom is a lot lower where the stream answer isn't necessarily a monarch but their wisdom is a lot higher so therefore they'll be able to more actively help a lot more people who are interested in learning and practicing the teachings. And are there any modern day equivalents to a wheel turning monarch? A wheel turning monarch would be someone like perhaps here in Thailand, if we have a king that we just had uh, Rama nine, who was, uh, who passed away in 2016, who uh, was king for over 65 years. He was the longest reigning monarch uh, during our times where he became king when he was about 26 years old and he passed away when he was 94. He would be someone who I would consider to be a wheel turning monarch. His practice was very far along. He may even have been a, you know, a stream enterer or a once returner or even higher. I don't know because I never had a chance to really interact with him but he surely was practicing the teachings of the Buddha quite closely. He was someone who only ever had one wife. Uh, he was someone who dedicated his time, effort, energy, and resources through practicing generosity, helping the Thai people immensely. He practiced loving kindness, compassion, sympathetic joy, equanimity. There's just so many wholesome mental qualities that he had. And this is one of the reasons why the Thai people absolutely have adored him and had so much uh, goodwill towards him because of all that he was doing in his life to model these teachings of the Buddha. Now, someone might not say it that way here in Thailand, 
but because I can look at Rama 9 and say, wow, he absolutely was practicing in such a way that really modeled these teachings well in the world. He was a, a monarch and he was a, very influential to the Thai people. And during that time, the, the Thais uh, were very well connected, very confident, very well banded together, very strong. And the country really um, uh, stepped forward because of the activities of Rama 9 and all the contributions that he made that people had this wonderful role model to be able to model their decisions and their conduct after because they saw this king they looked up to him and they saw his conduct and a lot of people really adored him for all the ways that he lived his life and that would be someone who i would consider to for sure be a wheel turning monarch and he may have actually been much more than that he may have actually been a stream enter or a once returner a non-returner or an otter hunt yeah, that's nice to know thank you for sharing we'll go to basam he has a question well so the wisdom that a human being or a being in the heavenly realm has to start practicing in a moral way or start it a dedicating time and energy to practice this way this wisdom is not necessarily has been acquired in this very life it may have been acquired in a uh, previous lives in animal runs or lower runs any wisdom that we have in a particular life like right now there's a building and acquiring of wisdom over multiple lifetimes and depending on how awake the mind is, we actually have the ability to, to access that wisdom as residual memories from our previous lives. We may not realize that it is from our previous lives, but there is the ability to accumulate wisdom over multiple lifetimes and then have that beneficial to you in your current lifetime. Is that what you're asking, Basim? Yes, exactly, sure, yes. Okay, uh, perfect. Yep, you're welcome. Okay, we'll go to Basim next for the reading of the next chapter. All right. Well, there cannot be alteration in a stream enterer. Monks, there may be alteration in the four great elements, in the earth element, the water element, the fire element, the wind element. But there cannot be alteration in the noble dis disciple who possesses confirmed confidence in the Buddha, in the teachings, in the community. <clears throat> Therein, this is alteration that the noble disciple who possesses confirmed confidence in the Buddha might be reborn in hell, in the animal realm, or in the realm of afflicted spirits. This is impossible. Monks, there may be alteration in the four great elements, in the earth element, the water element, the fire element, the wind element, but there cannot be alteration in the noble disciple who possesses the virtue dear to the noble ones. Therein, this is alteration that the noble disciple who possesses the virtue dear to the noble ones might be reborn in hell in the animal realm or in the realm of afflicted spirits this is impossible okay thanks Basim. so this is an expansion on what the buddha was saying in the a previous chapter he was saying that a stream enter cannot regress right he can't decline from the first stage of enlightenment and go backwards here the buddha is just kind of explaining that further with a bit more words and saying if one has confirmed confidence in the buddha in the teachings in the community and has these virtues that are dear to the noble ones or this moral conduct that they can't be reborn in hell the animal realm or the realm of afflicted spirits it's impossible that they can't regress backwards uh, and this is because of entering into the stream one would have eliminated 
that fetter of doubt that means that they have confirmed confidence they know without a shadow of a doubt that it is that the buddha was in fact enlightened because here we are 2500 years later if you're experiencing the first stage of enlightenment you know that it's his teachings and that he was indeed a fully perfectly enlightened buddha because one of those main criteria to be a buddha is that you awaken on your own self-awaken you share the teachings during your lifetime and countless beings attain enlightenment and then you leave the teachings in the condition such that after your death multiple people and countless people can attain enlightenment after your death so if one's experiencing the first stage of enlightenment 2500 years now after the death of the buddha they know for sure that he was a fully perfectly enlightened buddha because they're experiencing that first stage and the benefits of that 2,500 years after his death, so he surely meets all those criteria. And, sh and along with confidence in his teachings and confidence in his community, because you would need those three things in order to attain enlightenment, is that you, or even this first stage of enlightenment, is you would need to have confidence in the Buddha, you would need to have access to his teachings, and you would need to have a connection with a community where you can source these teachings and you can gain support and encouragement from other members of the community and model your conduct through observing other people's uh, conduct and their mental discipline and understanding the wisdom that's part of that community. So the Buddha is saying that there might be alteration in these four great elements. This is the four elements of the physical body. He always describes the physical body through these four elements of earth, water, fire, and wind. And he's saying, okay, this physical body can essentially change and these four elements can change, but there can't be a change to the mind for someone who is a stream enterer. They can't regress out of that first stage. They will not be reborn in the lower realms whatsoever. Questions on this chapter? <clears throat> there are no questions on this chapter. We'll go to Nick for chapter 24. Six cases of incapability by one accomplished in the view, the first discourse. Monks, there are these six cases of incapability what six? One accomplished in view is, number one, incapable of considering any condition phenomenon as permanent. Number two, incapable of considering any condition phenomenon as pleasurable. Number three, incapable of considering any phenomenon as a self. Number four, or incapable of doing a grave act that brings immediate results. Number five, incapable of resorting to the belief that purity and enlightenment comes about through superstitious and auspicious acts. Number six, incapable of seeking a person worthy of offerings outside here. These are the six cases of incapability. All right. Thank you, Nick. So here, the Buddha is sharing one version of the six cases of incapability of one accomplished in view. This is just one discourse. You're going to see others as well as we progress here in these chapters. One accomplished in view is one who is well accomplished in right view. That first stage of, or I'm sorry, that first step of the Eightfold Path and in order to get to the first stage of enlightenment, one would have to be accomplished in view. So accomplished in view and the first stage of enlightenment kind of go hand in hand because you wouldn't be able to get to the first stage of enlightenment without being accomplished in view. And the Buddha gives six cases of incapability, but he's going to give some more cases of incapability too as we go forward in these chapters. The first one here is incapable of considering any condition, phenomenon, or thing as permanent. That's because someone who has right view deeply understands the three universal truths and that very first universal truth that you learn as part of your development on the path to enlightenment is the universal truth of impermanence. Someone would understand that all conditioned phenomenon or all conditioned things or all conditioned objects are impermanent. So therefore, one accomplished in view would be incapable 
of considering anything, any object that is conditioned to be permanent. Also, it would be incapable, someone who is accomplished in view would be incapable of considering a conditioned phenomenon or thing as pleasurable. This is related to conditioned pleasant feelings. So someone may still be experiencing a bit of conditioned pleasant feelings, but they would be incapable of considering it pleasurable. So you might say, yes, I understand that I enjoy going to the movies. I enjoy spending time with my children. I enjoy uh, eating this piece of chocolate cake, but this con I'm not going to base that enjoyment on this condition that I'm going to cling to this movie or I'm going to cling to spending time with my kids or I'm going to cling to this piece of chocolate cake and considering this condition that I need this condition in order for there to be pleasure in the mind. So someone who's well accomplished in view is going to understand con that conditioned feelings are discontentedness and that the goal is to eliminate these condition pleasant feelings, condition painful feelings, and condition feelings that are neither painful nor pleasant. And there's a whole path that the Buddha trains in order to how to do that. So one who's accomplished in view will not have accomplished that yet, but they will be incapable of considering or thinking about these things as being pleasurable. But instead that we understand that these conditioned things, these conditioned objects, these conditioned phenomenon are things that we need in our life. We need to eat food. We need to spend time with our children. We need to uh, in, you know, have certain aspects of life that we go about and that we enjoy, but we don't allow our mind to consider that these are the things that we absolutely want and we're attached to and we're longing for in order to create pleasant feelings in the mind. But instead, when we experience these things, we enjoy them in the moment and then we understand that they're impermanent and we move on, no longer clinging to those things. Number three is incapable of considering any phenomenon or thing or object as a self. This relates to personal existence view, that very first fetter in the universal truth of non-self. So here in the very first three, the Buddha is talking about the three universal truths. The first one is the universal truth of impermanence. The second one is the universal truth of discontentedness. And the third one is the universal truth of non-self. So the Buddha is saying anyone accomplished in view will understand these three universal truths and know that there is no self here. There's a physical body, there's a mind that have come together for this particular existence, but these are not who you are as a person. This self-image or this self-identity, it's not who you are, so you wouldn't be able to consider this physical body or this mind as being the self. You would know that there is no self, and you will deeply practice that and see the truth for yourself that that is the case. So those are the three universal truths. This fourth one of incapable of doing a grave act that brings immediate results. This relates to what they call the five heinous crimes, which we're going to be talking about here in a minute. The Buddha elaborates on this. These are things like uh, killing your mother, killing your father, uh, uh, killing an enlightened being, uh, harming a Buddha, things like this. You're going to see these are grave acts that bring immediate results. And we'll be discussing those here in a moment. Incapable of resorting to the belief that purity or enlightenment comes about through suspicious and auspicious acts. This is rites, ritual, ceremonies, and worship. Because that third fetter is wrong observances and wrong behaviors. Part of that is practicing the full path deeply, but the other part of that fetter and having eliminated that fetter is eliminating rites, rituals, ceremonies, and worship, realizing that those things don't lead to enlightenment, that a person who's accomplished in view and who's attained the first stage of enlightenment understands dependent origination. They understand dependent origination, that it's ignorance, the unknowing of true reality that brings about discontentedness and rebirth. And that in order to get to purity or to enlightenment, we need to transform ignorance to wisdom. That it's not the superstitious, it's not the auspicious acts, it's not rites, rituals, and ceremonies that leads to enlightenment. It's learning, reflecting, practicing, 
observing the truth through your independent verification to acquire wisdom. That's what leads to enlightenment, not rites, rituals, ceremonies, and worship. And then incapable of seeking a person worthy of offerings outside of here. Outside of here means his community, because remember, during his lifetime, there were multiple communities that were claiming that it was their teachings that lead to enlightenment. But the Buddha knew it was his teachings because he was experiencing enlightenment and he knew deeply what that is. And now, 2,500 years later, more and more people know that it was the Buddha's teachings and all those other teachers and disciplines have fallen away because they weren't working and that's why we don't know about those teachings we know about the Buddha's teachings and someone who has accomplished in view who's attained the first stage of enlightenment they deeply understand and have confidence in the Buddha his teachings the community and if they're going to make any offerings for support in order to continue teachings in the world they're going to offer make offerings to their teacher and particularly to the community that was around the buddha at that time but now 2500 years later the people who are practicing in such a way that are sharing these teachings in the world the buddha says you wouldn't make offerings to anybody outside of that community because you will have experienced the first stage of enlightenment accomplished in view you would diminish this discontentedness you would be able to see that for yourself and you would have such confidence in these teachings that you're not going to make offerings to other communities because you already know you're part of a community that is helping to transform your mind through your own efforts of course but it's the teachings within this community that are benefiting the condition of your mind so therefore if you're going to make offerings to a particular community in order to continue the teachings and develop merit that wholesome gamma that you're going to make those offerings within this community that you're learning and practicing to have attained that first stage of enlightenment and now being accomplished in view that you would be incapable of seeking a person worthy of offerings outside of here because you would know that it's this community that has helped you get to this first stage of enlightenment and you're not interested in supporting another aspect of teachings because you know the tradition that you're learning and the community that you're learning within is surely leading to progress so you would make offerings in order to build up your own community so that that community continue to flourish and benefit other people besides just you any questions on this chapter <clears throat> looks like there's a question on facebook which person will read yes uh, benikshet has a question isn't shunita a universal truth like anika dukkha anatta so you're using the poly words which i don't use i don't teach with poly because it's a very old language that very few people understand. And if we start using Pali, then our community can't really flourish and foster continued growth because there's only a select number of people that understand those words. And not everyone even agrees what those words actually mean because it's such a old language that it's no longer spoken and people don't agree on what the meanings of those words are. So the three universal truths are impermanence, discontentedness and non-self these are the english translations and if you look at volume one chapter four you'll see that i've detailed these universal truths and explain them in detail using the words of the buddha but also my own words to help you understand what those three universal truths are so it's important that you learn them in english so that then you'll have a wider and wider and wider community of people in which to interact with and be able to discuss these teachings I don't use the word suffering. If you've heard that one, you'll understand why when you read chapter four, volume one, of why I don't use that word. Instead, I use discontentedness. So those are the three universal truths. The universal truth of impermanence, discontentedness, and non-self. That's what those first three in this chapter are related to. Amina has a question. She writes, for point number two, how would that relate to considering a piece of chocolate cake as temporarily pleasurable? Right, so a person who's accomplished in view would understand that any conditioned feeling is discontentedness. 
and that that's not something that you aspire to experience, that you're looking to actively eliminate those. So while you might observe a piece of chocolate cake and you know that that chocolate cake tastes good and you may even eat that chocolate cake and you actually may even enjoy it while you're eating it but you won't consider this piece of chocolate cake as something that you would like to base your feelings on, that you are not interested in arising pleasant feelings based on this condition of the chocolate cake. You see the chocolate cake, you know it tastes good, you might even enjoy it while you're eating it, but when it's done, it's done, it's over, and the mind's not gonna cling to it. There are no more questions. All right. I thought I saw Nick's hand up. He might have a question here, Manal. I'm not sure if you see that on your device. Oh, you're correct. That's right. Yes, thank you. <clears throat> Teacher David, um, question. How would a practitioner um, verify or know if they made it to the first stage of enlightenment? Uh, I, I know it's been stated that self-evaluation is loaded with errors um, would it just be by verifying the things in, in these these chapters like 1 through 20 and some other things um, as, as a checklist on what to work on or what they have already successfully done there's um, nothing that has been developed like a checklist although this book that is here we could probably put a checklist together pretty easily there's multiple things that need to be accomplished there's not a way to really uh, give a checklist necessarily that someone could self-evaluate uh, what's best is to just focus on continued learning and not really get really hung up on whether you're a stream enter or not because as soon as the mind wants to figure out if you're a stream enter then that's where the craving comes in and then if you actually distinguish yourself as being a stream enter sometimes that's where arrogance and pride comes in so instead i would suggest that you just keep learning and growing and maybe by the end of this book we can put together a checklist and at least you make sure that you're working on the things to get to stream entry but then just like i share with people don't even convince the mind that you're enlightened don't even convince the mind that you're a stream enter because as soon as that happens that's where either complacency will set in or arrogance and pride will come in and that's really dangerous for the mind so what i would suggest instead is just to make that checklist perhaps and ensure that you're focusing on each one of those things things like confirmed confidence in the buddha the dhamma I'm sorry, the Buddha, the teachings, the community, having the moral conduct from the Eightfold Path, uh, ensuring that you understand the five aggregates, the six sense bases, dependent origination. Uh, and there's more things here that you're going to keep learning throughout this book. So these are some of the things that you would need to uh, develop. And um, just as long as you know what those things are and you continue to work towards them and uh, surmount those and work past them and then eventually start working on the fourth and fifth fetter and beyond then that's the real goal that don't get too hung up on you know deciding that you are or are necessarily a stream enter because i think that can be really dangerous for the mind and that's why i even say don't even convince the mind that you're enlightened once you have gone a year two years three years without any discontentedness don't even convince yourself at that point that you're actually enlightened just be, remain humble and understand that you're just continuing to practice the teachings and by the time the mind is enlightened it's so effortless that you're, you don't even feel like there's any effort involved at all in actually practicing the teachings because the mind has been so transformed understood teacher david thank you very kindly yeah i, I think a checklist would, would be would be helpful just to make be sure you're on track and because there's a lot there's a there's there's list after list in these cha in these chapters and subsequent chapters i think so you know it could probably be a good addition for the back of this book and uh just to kind of know what to focus on um, but i apologize that I, I i i'm not even if i had all of this ready right now i don't know that it would really be you know it'd be beneficial to look at it and to to be able to know what to focus on 
but in terms of like somebody declaring that they're a stream answer, even though the Buddha mentions that uh, at a couple of times in his teachings where he says, you know, one can declare of themselves that they're a stream answer. In other words, kind of know for yourself that you are a stream answer. Uh, even though the Buddha provides guidance along that, I, the way that I read that is just these are the things to focus on as opposed to kind of truly declaring in your own mind that you're a stream answer. Uh, because that's where things get uh, really dicey because of the conceit and the arrogance and the pride. And that's kind of the next set of fetters that someone's going to start really focusing on. And you're not interested in those things arising in the mind. Still teacher, David. I can see that. Thank you. You're welcome. Looks like there are no more questions. So we can go to Basim for chapter 25. <clears throat> Six cases of incapability by one accomplished in view, second discourse. Monks, there are these six cases of incapability. What six? One accomplished in view is incapable of residing without deep respect and politeness towards the teacher. Or incapable of residing without deep respect and politeness towards the teachings. Incapable of residing without deep respect and politeness towards the community. Incapable of residing without deep respect and politeness towards the training. Incapable of restoring, resorting to anything that should not be relied upon. Incapable of undergoing an eighth existence. These are the six cases of incapability. Okay. Thank you, Bassam. So here, this is another discourse of the six cases of incapability by one accomplished in view. Here, the first one, the Buddha says, incapable of residing without deep respect and politeness towards the teacher. Notice he didn't say the Tathagata or the perfectly enlightened one here. During his lifetime, you know, he was the main teacher. He's master teacher Gautama Buddha. But there were other people that were teaching as well that as people became more and more enlightened, those ordained practitioners and others would go out and actually teach. So the Buddha is sharing the teachings in a way that would be applicable during his lifetime and after his death. So he's not saying here that they should only have deep respect and politeness towards him, but anybody who's learned with any teacher who's gotten to the point of the first stage of enlightenment they understand that that teacher would have unselfishly helped them with lots of generosity in sharing these teachings because any teacher who would be sharing these teachings to help somebody get to stream entry would be doing so out of the generosity, the kindness and compassion of their own heart and their own mind. And they wouldn't be looking for anything in return. And that teacher would have been helping and helping and helping a student as they decide to seek more and more guidance. So any teacher who you've learned with, who you've gotten to the point where you have attained stream entry or accomplishment in view, the Buddha is saying person would have deep respect and politeness towards this teacher because they will have observed the improvement to the condition of the mind and they would be incapable of disrespecting that person or having impoliteness towards that person because they know that that person greatly helped them in their journey to enlightenment. And the same thing goes with the teachings in the community that the teachings that they would have learned to get to that point, they would have deep respect and politeness for them as well as the community that they're part of because that community would have helped them to actually acquire that first stage of enlightenment. It's the own work of the individual practitioner to accomplish the first stage of enlightenment. But there's community members, as you see, we all get together on a regular basis and we all practice these teachings with each other, practicing in our interactions with each other, both in our time together and then outside of class too, when we spend time talking and interacting with each other. So uh, the teacher, the teachings, and the community are very important and we would have deep respect and politeness practicing that good wholesome moral conduct towards all of these things incapable of residing without deep respect towards the training now there's the teachings but then there's actually the training as well which oftentimes involves things that a teacher is going to be doing in order to help 
their students. It's not going to be just delivering discourses, but as you interact with your teacher, they're going to be doing things along the way, whether you realize it or not, that they're going to be doing things to actually help you along the path. Uh, it's still your work. It's still your independent practice, but the way we phrase things, the way we interact with you, the way that we observe certain things in your mind, we kind of say things and uh, conduct ourselves in ways that will help you along this path and this training sometimes can for someone who's not in the first stage of enlightenment can feel pretty mundane or it can feel pretty rough or, or difficult or uh, a practitioner can kind of struggle with it uh, and maybe even think that uh, their teacher is doing something harmful to them uh, but they're really not they're they're doing things out of compassion and loving kindness there's nothing that should be hurtful or harmful to the student, but the mind can perceive it that way. There's a, a famous kind of mem that floats around Facebook where there's like a master monk and he goes to, and some younger monks come to him and says, what would you like us to do? And he's like, move those bricks from there over to here. So then they take a couple of hours and they're sweating and they move those bricks from one place to another and pile them up in another place. And then they say, okay, what would you like us to do? And he's like, okay, move those bricks back. And now they get mad and they get angry and they're like sweating and they're rambling with bad words and they take the bricks from there and they move them to the other place. And then they're like, all right, what would you like us to do? And he's like, oh, move them back over there. And now they're kind of complaining a little bit less, but they're still complaining. And they move them over there. And now at the end of the day, they're, they're, all, they're pretty exhausted and they're like, well, what do you want us to do now? And he's like, oh, move them back over there. And finally, they kind of get the whole thing that he's trying to help them do is to let go of the complaining, to let go of the negativity, to let go of the pessimism and just move them happily and peacefully from one location to the next. And now when the master monk observes that his students have happily, peacefully, kindly and lovingly moved the bricks from one place to the other, the monks are like, OK, what would you like us to do? He's like, oh, you're done. So the object of the task for the master monk and for the young monks wasn't for them to move the bricks from one place to the other because they were completely fine in the place where they were at. The objective of the task that the master monk was trying to help them learn is that when a task is given to you, do it peacefully, do it happily, do it with joy. Don't complain and have this pessimistic view. And once they figured that out, then the task was over. There was no need to move these bricks anymore. So this training that your teachers will sometimes uh, share with you along the way, I don't know that I've ever asked the student to move bricks from one place to the other back and forth, but after seeing that, I've certainly thought about it. There's other things that we do like that in order as we observe a student's mind and we spend time with them face to face that we're able to kind of help students train in different ways than just delivering discourses. So someone who understands this and they have trust and confidence in their teacher and this teacher would have helped them through multiple situations like this. They would have deep respect and politeness towards the training itself, which sometimes involves more than just meditation more than just learning from a book. It involves other things as well as you're going throughout your day and interacting with your teacher. The fifth one is incapable of resorting to anything that should be relied upon. So here, this or should not be relied upon. So let me read that again. Incapable of resorting to anything that should not be relied upon. What this relates to is that a practitioner who's accomplished in view will understand the process of learning something, reflecting on it to independently verify the teachings, and practicing it to be able to independently observe the truth in order to get to wisdom. So a person who's accomplished in view would not just believe something. This is what belief is. It's anything that should not be relied upon. A person who's accomplished in view is not going to believe anything. They're not going to believe their teacher. They're not going to believe things that they see on Facebook necessarily or memes or things that people see. They're going to investigate what's being shared with them and they will have developed a well-developed practice that they'll be able to learn, reflect, and practice in such a way to determine the truth about something. And that's what the Buddha is saying here is that a practitioner who's accomplished in view will know this process 
of being able to independently verify things to be able to discover the truth and acquire wisdom that they would not resort to anything that should not be relied upon they would not have false beliefs they would not have misperceptions because they would be able to determine the truth through analyzing it reflecting on it investigating it and practicing to see what is true and what is not and then lastly incapable of going through an eighth existence because as a stream enterer someone in the first stage of enlightenment will not experience an eighth existence there's a maximum of seven existences once someone attains stream entry and someone might attain stream entry and go right on through to enlightenment and not experience any other existences after their current existence but they will be incapable of experiencing an eighth existence what questions do you guys have on this chapter? There are no questions, Teacher David. All right. Ch the next for chapter 26. <clears throat> Six cases of incapability by one accomplished in the view, the third discourse. Monks, there are these six cases of incapability. What six? One accomplished in view is incapable of depriving his mother of life. Number two, incapable of depriving his father of life. Number three, incapable of depriving an arahant of life. Number four, incapable of shedding the Tathagata's blood with a mind of hatred. Number five, incapable of creating a division in the community. Number six, incapable of acknowledging another teacher. Okay. These are the six cases of incapability. Okay, thanks, Nick. Uh, so here we've got another discourse, and there's one more after this that the Buddha is describing the six cases of incapability of one accomplished in view. And I think this is a good time to explain how in the past, when we've explored certain discourses, uh, not necessarily ones that are in a sequence like this, but I've shared with you about how we shouldn't look at the Buddhist teachings in isolation of just one thing and uh, just only that thing that we should always look at the Buddhist teachings in totality. And this is a good example of that because as you see here, if we would have read that very first discourse and think that the Buddha is saying there are these six cases of incapability, maybe the mind might think these are the only six cases of incapability but the buddha doesn't say that he just says these are six cases of incapability so always be sure that when you're reading the buddhist teachings that you read it exactly as it's there that if he says these are the only six cases of incapability that's what he means but if he says monks there are these six cases of incapability that doesn't mean they're the only six cases so that's where here we've got these four discourses that are sharing with us these multiple cases so four times six is 24 so we've got 24 cases of incapability and you might think that the buddha would just list out all of them at one time but that can be quite complicated for his students to be able to learn and absorb and remember all at one time so he kind of breaks it up in these smaller bites to be able to be digestible and understandable and he groups them in ways that are uh, related to each other so he's grouped these four discourses in ways that the individual six cases are somewhat relatable so that's why he doesn't say okay these are the 24 cases of incapability and just give it at one time because he's grouping them in ways that they're relatable that they're easier to remember and then he can slowly help a student digest them over time so whenever we're looking at the buddhist teachings always read what's there and don't add any extra thoughts into it and also look, don't look at it in isolation but look at the totality of it that there's multiple teachings that the buddha taught that you can relate to and see the whole totality of his teachings so here these are part of the five heinous crimes that people refer to it that way the buddha didn't refer to it as the five heinous crimes but people 
nowadays will refer to it that way. This is the way the Buddha referred to it as one accomplished in view is incapable of depriving his mother of life. This would be to kill his mother because one who's accomplished in view understands it's their mother and father that gave them this birth. And yes, it was your own decisions that led to this human birth, but it was your mother and father that gave you all those initial teachings of learning how to brush your teeth, how to put on your clothes, how to crawl, how to walk, how to run, how to urinate and defecate, how to eat, how to do so many things. Our original caregivers and the people who brought us into this world are to be respected and have politeness, kindness, kindness, friendliness, and respectfulness towards our original teachers of our mother and father. And then after our mothers and fathers, of course, we have taken on other teachers, and particularly your Buddhist teacher, in order to get to enlightenment. But you would still have this gratitude and appreciation for your mother and father, which are number one and two, and you would be incapable of killing them, is what the Buddha was saying here. The third one is being incapable of killing an otter hunt. This is an enlightened being, that one would be incapable of killing an enlightened being. If you are accomplished in view, you would be able to pretty much determine for yourself who's enlightened and who's not. You would be able to observe qualities of enlightenment in other people, even though you're not enlightened yourself, by the time you attain the first stage of enlightenment, you know what it takes to attain enlightenment. You haven't actually done it, but you know enough that you can observe certain qualities of other people's minds in their life practice, not that you're judging them, but you would be able to kind of determine, oh, this person appears to be enlightened, and you would be incapable of killing an enlightened being because you know that this person has deep wisdom in order to actually help other beings, and you wouldn't actually take their life. And in fact, you wouldn't be able to take anybody's life as part of being accomplished in view because you would be have already eliminated wrong grasp of behavior and observances, you would be practicing that first precept really, really closely, and you would have been practicing right action as part of the Eightfold Path, that you wouldn't be able to deprive any being of life, let alone your mother, father, an enlightened being. Or here, number four, the Buddha talks about even harming a Tathagata or an a Buddha or a fully perfectly enlightened one because someone who's attained the first stage of enlightenment if they're existing during the lifetime of a buddha they would potentially be able to know that their teacher is a buddha and what that means and how important that is and how beneficial it is to exist during the lifetime of a buddha or a tathagata and someone wouldn't even be able to shed the blood let alone kill an actual buddha or tathagata the fifth one is incapable of creating division in the community. So remember the politeness and the respect that the Buddha talked about of one's community. If you've been part of a community and you've attained the first stage of enlightenment, you have this deep politeness and respect and admiration and gratitude for the community that you're in, that you would be incapable of creating a division or a schism or a, uh, or a separation or attempting to break up this community. Uh, in malicious ways, in uh, deceptive ways, because you know the benefit that this community has brought you, and you would not look to create division or separation in, within this community. You would only be interested in creating more and more harmony and supporting this community, not only with your offerings and generosity, as the Buddha talked about in the previous chapter, but also you wouldn't even uh, do anything that would create a division or separation within this community. And then the Buddha talked about being incapable of acknowledging another teacher. So not just a Tathagata, because during his life he was a fully perfectly enlightened one, but as we were talking in the previous chapter, any teacher who has helped you to attain the first stage of enlightenment, you know that that teacher is either enlightened or very close to it and has helped you unselfishly with lots of of, of generosity to be able to help you get to the first stage of enlightenment. And the Buddha is saying that someone who's attained the first stage of enlightenment through the teachings of any particular teacher, you would be incapable 
of acknowledging another teacher because you know that that teacher has put in time, effort, energy, and resources to help you get to that first stage of enlightenment. Therefore, you wouldn't just wander off and decide, you know, I don't really need to pay attention to this teaching of this teacher any longer. I'm just going to kind of go over here and mosey about and kind of take up training with uh, XYZ teacher. But as a person who's accomplished in view, someone who's a stream answer would know that it was this teacher's teachings and that person's time, effort, energy, and resources that led to your first stage of enlightenment and you would be incapable of acknowledging anyone else to be your actual teacher. And that's what these six here, the Buddha's talking about. So what questions do you guys have on this chapter? <coughs> Looks like Nick has his hand raised. Thank you, Mal. Yes, sir. Teacher David, in your description, you um, mentioned wrong grasp of behavior. Um, are there things besides rites, which rituals, and ceremonies um, that fall under that, like um, successfully following the core teachings? That's also covered by eliminating the third fetter, because I heard you mention the first precept, and then you also mentioned uh, right action under the eightfold path. Yes, so it's rites, rituals, ceremonies, and worship, as well as the eightfold path. Practicing the eightfold path. If you look in volume one, when I describe the Eightfold Path, and we're going to have it, I think, in chapter 29 or 30 today, um, that when, I dis when the Buddha describes the Eightfold Path, he describes a certain level of moral conduct. So, for example, in right action, he describes refraining and abandoning from killing, from stealing and from sexual misconduct and then it's the five precepts that expand those and explain what those truly are and then when he explains something like right speech he explains it to a certain level of detail with things like uh, slander and frivolous speech and things like this but when i explain it in volume one because i'm looking to really expand the eightfold path and really show a hundred percent of what this full eightfold path is i go into things like the five factors of well-spoken speech and under right action i go into uh, gambling and uh, substances that cause heedlessness and a whole bunch of other things like that in order to fully elaborate on the full entire eightfold path that an enlightened being would be practicing but in terms of eliminating wrong grasp of behaviors and observances not only is it rites rituals and ceremonies and worship but it's the buddha's eightfold path to the level of detail that the buddha is prescribing as part of his training so if you look at his words which we're going to see here in a moment then you'll see that there's just kind of a certain level of detail that is um not as deep as what i'm teaching in volume one as the eightfold path so if you look at the eightfold path as the buddha teaches it that's what rites rituals and ceremonies worship and these other uh, behaviors. When he talks about wrong grasp of behaviors, he's talking about the Eightfold Path. And when he's talking about observances, he's talking about rites, rituals, ceremonies, and worship. Thank you, Venerable Sir. You're welcome. Doesn't appear there are any more questions. All right, so we'll go to the next chapter. <clears throat> Six cases of incapability by one accomplished in view, fourth discourse. Monks, there are these six cases of incapability. What six? One accomplished in view is incapable of resorting to the view that pleasure and pain are made by oneself. Incapable of resorting to the view that pleasure and pain are made by another. Incapable of resorting to the view that pleasure and pain are both made by oneself and made by another. Incapable of resorting to the view that pleasure and pain are not made by oneself, but have arisen by accident or chance. Incapable of resorting to the view that pleasure and pain are not made by another, but have arisen by accident or chance. 
incapable of resorting to the view that pleasure and pain are made neither by oneself nor another, but have arisen by accident or chance. These are the six cases of incapability. For what reason? Because the person accomplished in view has clearly seen causation and causally arisen objects. These are the six cases of incapability. Okay, thank you, Bossum. So here, this relates to dependent origination. For someone who's accomplished in view, who's attained that first stage of enlightenment, they will understand dependent origination. And they will understand, of course, also the Four Noble Truths, that these causality, the 12 cases of dependent origination, or those 12 conditions of dependent origination is what leads to the arising of discontentedness specifically craving desire attachment arising discontentedness but more specifically those 10 12 conditions of dependent origination so here if someone is accomplished in view and they've attained that first stage of enlightenment they will be incapable of resorting to the view that pleasure and pain are made by oneself because we know that it's craving desire attachment in the mind and we also know as part of the first stage of enlightenment that there is no self that it's not made by the self because there is no self there we understand the universal truth of non-self and that it's not made by another person because it's made by our own craving desire attachment and all those other conditions as part of dependent origination it's not made by both oneself and another because of dependent origination it's craving desire attachment that causes these discontent feelings resorting to the view that pain and pleasure are not made by oneself but have arisen by chance or accident that's not possible because it's not just by accident or chance or some luck or some unfortunate circumstances that one is angry or frustrated or irritated or annoyed or feeling guilt or shame. It's because of craving desire attachment and more specifically going all the way back to dependent origination. It's ignorance or the unknowing of true reality and all those other conditions. Incapable of resorting to the view that pleasure and pain are not made by another meaning another person, but have arisen by accident or chance. Same thing. It's not accident or chance. It's this 12 aspects of dependent origination that arises discontentedness. And then incapable of resorting to the view that discontentedness are made neither by oneself nor by another, but have arisen by accident or chance. So the Buddha is encapsulating everything here to really hone in and saying you you really need to understand in order to be accomplished in view and get to the first stage of enlightenment to deeply understand what is causing discontentedness pleasure and pain those pleasant feelings and painful feelings a person in the first stage of enlightenment will still be experiencing discontentedness it will be limited it will be diminished but they will at least understand what is actually causing it because now they're going to make the rest of their journey to enlightenment because they understand all of these baseline teachings that are really needed to get to the point where you can extinguish discontentedness 100 percent and then the buddha makes it clear here where he says for what reason and it's because the person is accomplished in view has clearly seen causation and causally arisen objects that's dependent origination that he's talking about there questions on this chapter doesn't appear there are any questions we'll go to nick for chapter 28. all right perfect mana and this was the question nick had so it's ideal that he's reading it all right this is the this is what he's this is what he's talking about nick when he talks about wrong grasp of behavior and observances this is the behavior exactly what you see here in the moral conduct of the Eightfold Path. So when you get to right speech, right action, right livelihood, someone will be practicing that fully. All right, thank you, teacher, very helpful. The Noble Eightfold Path, the way of practice leading to the elimination of discontentedness. And what monks is the noble truth of the way of practice leading to the elimination of discontentedness? It is just this noble eightfold path, namely, right view, right intention, right
right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, right concentration. And what monks is right view? It is, monks, the wisdom of discontentedness, the wisdom of the cause of discontentedness, the wisdom of the elimination of discontentedness, and the wisdom of the way of practice leading to the elimination of discontentedness. This is called right view. And what monks is right attention, intention. The intention of renunciation, the intention of non ill will, the intention of harmlessness. This monks is called right intention. And what monks is right speech, refraining from lying, refraining from slander, refraining from harsh speech, refraining from frivolous speech. This is called right speech. And what monks is right action, refraining from taking life, refraining from taking what is not given, refraining from sexual misconduct. This is called right action. And what monks is right livelihood? Here, monks, the noble disciple, having given up wrong livelihood, keeps himself by right livelihood. And what monks is right effort? Here, monks, a monk rouses his will, makes an effort, stirs up energy, exerts his mind, and strives to prevent the, ar the arising of unarism, evil, unwholesome mental states. He rouses his will, makes an effort, stirs up energy, exerts his mind, and strives to overcome evil, unwholesome mental states that have arisen. He rouses his will, makes an effort, stirs up energy, exerts his mind, and strives to produce unarisen, wholesome mental states. He rouses his will, makes an effort, stirs up energy, exerts his mind and strives to maintain wholesome mental states that have arisen, not to let them fade away, to bring them to greater growth, to the full perfection of development. This is called right effort. And what monks is right mindfulness? Here monks, a monk resides reflecting on body as the body, dedicated, clearly aware and mindful, Having put aside craving and worry for the world, he resides reflecting on feelings as feelings, dedicated, clearly aware and mindful. Having put aside craving and worry for the world, he resides reflecting on mind as mind, dedicated, clearly aware and mindful. Having put aside craving and worry for the world, he resides reflecting on mental objects as mental objects, dedicated, Clearly aware and mindful, having put aside craving and worry for the world. This is called right mindfulness. And what monks is right concentration? Here a monk, distant from the sense desires, distant from unwholesome mental states, enters and resides in the first jhana, which is with thinking and pondering, based in seclusion, filled with excitement and joy, and with the subsiding of thinking and pondering, by gaining inner tranquility and oneness of mind, he enters and resides in the second jhana, which is without thinking and pondering, based in concentration, filled with excitement and joy. And with the fading away of excitement, remaining imperturbable, unable to be upset or excited, calm and serene, mindful and clearly aware, he experiences in himself the joy of which the noble ones say, <clears throat> peaceful is he who resides with equanimity and mindfulness. He enters the third jhana, and having given up pleasure and pain, and with the fading away of former gladness and sadness, he enters and resides in the fourth jhana, which is beyond pleasure and pain and purified by equanimity and mindfulness. This is called right concentration. And that monks 
is called the way of practice leading to the elimination of discontentedness. All right. Thank you, Nick. So I've taught the Eiffel Path a number of times in the group learning program in a lot of detail. And I've even taught it in this program, I think about two times going through the Buddha's words in a lot of detail. So I'm not going to go through in step by step and teach it to the level of detail that I have before. Instead, what I'm going to do is focus on these three that relate to the wrong grasp of behavior and observances because that's that third fetter that needs to be eliminated in order to get to the first stage of enlightenment. So in the Eightfold Path that I teach, I teach it with the Buddha's words using this, but then I further expand it with the five factors of well-spoken speech and other things that the Buddha taught because what the Buddha did is he kind of taught in these layers where he layered the teachings and as when somebody is able to practice to a certain level of detail then there's more layers below that below that below that and that really helps to kind of gradually guide someone towards enlightenment but when I was writing that first book I didn't even know if I was going to write any additional books after that. So I just kind of consolidated everything into chapter five about the Eightfold Path so that we would just have one place that really flushes out all the various details, not just this certain level of detail that the Buddha has here. But when he talks about the third fetter of wrong grasp of behavior and observances, he's referring to these three steps, the moral conduct of the Eightfold Path. So if one is to eliminate wrong grasp of, of observances and behaviors, they will have eliminated from the mind the belief that it's rites, rituals, ceremonies, and worship that is going to lead to enlightenment because they would understand that it's ignorance and they need to transform that into wisdom because of dependent origination. That is what's going to lead to enlightenment. And this behavior that the Buddha is talking about is that in terms of speech, a stream enter is not going to be fully practicing the five factors of well-spoken speech in every single situation in every single relationship. That's what they would aspire for. That's what they would be working towards. But a stream enter still has ill will in the mind. They haven't eliminated that fetter yet. So there's still going to be anger. There's still going to be some frustration. There's still going to be some irritation. And that's going to come across in their speech and their actions sometimes. But a stream enter someone who's accomplished in view, someone who's eliminated that third fetter will be practicing right speech to the level of detail that they will never lie. They will never have slander, which is publicly defaming or gossiping about someone. They will refrain from harsh speech. So they will be practicing gentle speech. Just one of, That's one of those factors of the five factors of enlightenment. So is speaking truthful so the second and third factor of the five factors of well-spoken speech will be mastered by a stream enter so they will be speaking gently they won't be speaking with harsh speech and they will be refraining from frivolous speech okay frivolous speech is like idle chatter unpurposeful speech unbeneficial speech that's the fourth factor of the five factors of well-spoken speech but a person who's not a person who's a stream enter, they're not necessarily going to be practicing the first factor of well spoken speech, which is speaking at the right time, because they still have some craving in their mind. So oftentimes we speak at the wrong time because we still have craving and the, and the mind's kind of pushing and pushing and pushing and speaking at the wrong time. And they also won't be speaking the, that fifth factor, which is a mind of loving kindness, because their mind hasn't fully transformed ill will into loving kindness so therefore a person who's a stream enter won't be practicing the five factors of well-spoken speech fully they'll know what they are but they won't necessarily be practicing them but they will be practicing right speech to this level of detail same thing with right action there's many aspects to right action ensuring we're not causing harm through our bodily actions but a stream enter someone accomplished in view wouldn't be taking life. They wouldn't be killing any beings whatsoever, even insects or anything like that. They wouldn't be stealing. That's refraining from taking what is given and they won't have sexual misconduct. They still may be having sex as part of that first stage of enlightenment, that first and second stage of enlightenment. Someone still has sensual desire. 
So they might have noticed that their sensual desire and their interest in sexual intercourse has diminished, um, but they won't be um, having sexual misconduct. They won't have multiple partners. They won't uh, be having sex with minors. They won't be uh, breaking up relationships and having sex with people who are in committed relationships or if they're in a committed relationship they won't be having sex outside of that so that's what the buddha is talking about here in terms of refraining from sexual misconduct you can look at the third precept in the way that the buddha teaches it in volume one chapter seven the five precepts are there and you can see the first three precepts that the buddha teaches which is part of right action so a stream mentor would be practicing right action to this level of detail and then what is right livelihood? So a stream mentor is going to be practicing right livelihood. And the Buddha gives five wrong livelihoods as part of their teachings that help you to first start understanding right livelihood. And he talks about not having business in um, weapons, not having business in living beings, not having business in meat, not having business in uh, weapons, and not having... Uh, business in poisons um actually i'm sorry i think i already said weapons not have business in intoxicants selling substances that cause heedlessness and not having business in selling poisons so these five a stream enter will not be practicing one of those five so there's right livelihood being practiced to a certain level of detail when we get into volume eight is about householders and when we get into volume 12 you'll see that the buddha deepens his teaching around right livelihood that it's not just these five wrong livelihoods that someone will purge in order to be practicing and have purified their livelihood but there's another level of detail in terms of wrong livelihoods so the buddha talks about that livelihood as a livelihood that's not affected by the taints or the fetters that's what an enlightened being will be practicing is this deeper level of right livelihood but a stream enter will be practicing uh, where they won't be practicing business in weapons business in living beings business in meat business in substances that cause heedlessness or businesses in poisons they will have purged those five wrong livelihoods but they're still maybe practicing a livelihood that they're not quite fully fulfilled with yet and it's still being affected by the taints of craving anger and ignorance and some of the other taints as well or the fetters so you'll see that deeper teaching on right livelihood when we get into volume 8 and when we get into volume 12 so those are the three that I'd like to highlight here, but I can accept questions on any of these steps of the Eightfold Path in our class today, but I just thought in terms of teaching, I would just teach those related to that third fetter of wrong grasp of uh, behavior and observances. Looks like Nick has his hand raised. Teacher David, just to clarify, uh, for example, right livelihood, for a stream enter, it's just the uh, not doing the five wrong livelihoods. Exactly. That's all that's needed for stream entry. Exactly. Just not doing one of the five wrong livelihoods. And then beyond that, in order to get to enlightenment, you would need to be practicing this deeper level of right livelihood that you haven't uh, had exposure to yet, unless you've uh, read the eighth volume or the twelfth volume. And in there, there's a chapter dedicated to uh, understanding right livelihood at a much deeper level. All right. I do recall, just one further question. I do recall the five wrong livelihoods, and then there was um, another sentence followed, following that um, somewhere. Somewhere, I think when, when, he, when the Buddha's talking about the five wrong livelihoods, Additionally, there's a sentence that says something along the lines of not scheming, not, not I forget the rest, but do you know what I'm referring to, Teacher David? Yes. Is that part of the stream entry as well? Is that including, or, or no, it's just the five wrong livelihoods? It's just the five wrong livelihoods. That one shows up as part of 
the deeper teachings, not just that, but something even deeper than that. If you would like to see that chapter, uh, let me know because it's in, I know it's in volume 12. I think I might have put it in volume 8, but it might only be in volume 12. And volume 12 is being proofread right now. So, uh, but I can still send you that chapter if you'd like to uh, understand more about that, uh, the deeper teachings on right livelihood that the Buddha shares about not having a livelihood that is affected by the taints. Yes, sir, that would be very generous. I'd appreciate that. Okay, Thank you, sir. I'll send it to you after class. Doesn't appear to be any other questions. We'll go to last one for chapter 29. I have a stream enterer is called Monks. When a noble disciple thus understands as they really are the cause and the passing away of the world, he is then called a noble disciple who is accomplished in view, who is accomplished in vision, who has arrived at these true teachings, who sees these true teachings, who possesses a trainee wisdom, who possesses a trainee's true wisdom, who has entered the dream of the teachings, a noble one with penetrative wisdom, one who stands squarely before the door to the this is enlightenment all right thank you possum so here the buddha is saying monks when a noble disciple thus understands as they really are the cause and the passing away of the world he is called essentially a noble disciple or one accomplished in view a stream enter so again this is a perfect example of how we can't look at the buddhist teachings in isolation because if someone just read this, they might say, oh, that's all you need to do to get accomplishment in view is just uh, understand the cause and passing away of the world, which is describing the universal truth of impermanence is what the Buddha is talking about here. Uh, so we need to see the whole totality of the Buddhist teachings in order to truly understand what it takes to get to accomplishment in view and uh, to be able to attain the first stage of enlightenment. So here the Buddha is uh, talking about that universal truth of impermanence because a noble disciple, one accomplished in view, one who's a stream enter, would understand the causes and passing away of the world, the universal truth of impermanence, and that these things are not permanent. This earth is not permanent. This planet is not permanent. This physical body is not permanent. Uh, the things that we experience in life are not permanent. Uh, but that's just one aspect of this progression to the first stage of enlightenment. We talked about this second paragraph last class. So if there's anybody who has questions about this that maybe wasn't with us last class, I am pleased to answer any questions that you guys have on that particular chapter or that particular paragraph. Does not appear there are any questions, Teacher David? Um, we can go to chapter 30 and we'll read that. <clears throat> the ten fetters monks there are these ten fetters what ten the five lower fetters and five higher fetters and what are the five lower fetters number one personal existence field number two doubt number three wrong grasp of behavior and observances. Number four, sensual desire. And number five, ill will. These are the five lower fetters. And what are the high, and what are the five higher fetters? Number six, desire for form. Number seven, desire for formless. Number eight, conceit. Number nine, restlessness. And number 10, ignorance. These are the five higher fetters. These monks are the 10 fetters. All right, thanks, Nick. So a fetter is described as a ball and chain that's essentially shackled to your ankle. This is what's keeping the mind trapped in the unenlightened state. 
So this fetter of holding you down, holding you in this discontentedness, holding you in this cycle of rebirth, and it's the elimination of the ten fetters that moves the mind to enlightenment, and this ball and shackle is eliminated from holding you in the cycle of rebirth and holding you in discontentedness. So eliminating these is really important, and this is how someone actually attains enlightenment. These are also referred to as the taints or the defilements or the pollution of mind. And each one of these fetters are described in volume one and other parts of this book series so that you understand what they are. And what your practice is, is once you move into the jhanas and you're moving into the first stage of enlightenment, you will uh, make this part of your learning so that you will learn what these 10 fetters are, these pollutions, understand how they're affecting you, how they're causing the mind to experience discontentedness and causing harm and uh, causing struggles and difficulties in your life. And by eliminating these gradually over time, that's where the mind starts to gradually start to experience more and more peacefulness of the enlightened mind. And it's not until all of these 10 fetters are completely eliminated that the mind will be experiencing enlightenment where it'll be peaceful, calm, serene, and content with joy permanently. So it's really important to understand these 10 fetters. And it's something that you learn kind of in the beginning part of your understanding of the path, but then you really start focusing on them deeply as you start experiencing the jhanas. And as part of this book series, in volume one, chapter three, I explain them in detail using this that you see here. But then I also copy and paste this same content in multiple parts of the book series because they are so important and somebody needs to understand these in a lot of detail. So if you guys have any questions on any of these, we can discuss them in detail about what they are, how they cause struggles and difficulties in your life, and then actually how to remove them as well. So let me know which ones you would like to discuss and any kind of clarity that you would like around any of these. Teacher David, I would like to know clearly the distinguishing um, factors between doubt and investigation of something in the mind. Okay, so uh, it, it is investigation of the teachings and investigating what's in the mind that leads to the elimination of doubt. Without investigation, that enlightenment factor of investigation where there's a keen interest, a determined interest to investigate the teachings and then not believing them, but instead learning, reflecting, and practicing to discover the truth, acquiring wisdom, that that's what ultimately eliminates doubt is because by more and more accumulation of wisdom, you start experiencing those jhanas and you start experiencing a diminishing of discontentedness and all those other qualities of mind that start happening that you get to the point where you have no doubt that these teachings are what's leading you to enlightenment. You might not fully understand all the teachings at this point having eliminated doubt. You might not um, have confirmed something like the cycle of rebirth, for example. Someone who's in the first stage of enlightenment may still uh, not fully uh, understand that they have had all these different lives and that they might not have seen the evidence of those previous lives. So they might still uh, have disbelief perhaps that the cycle of rebirth is, is true because they may not have seen the actual uh, proof or evidence in observing their past lives. But they will know that those core teachings of the three universal truths, the four noble truths, the eightfold path, the five precepts, these ten fetters, and all the other preliminary teachings that I share that are the core central teachings, things like the Brahma Viharas and extensive meditation training, that that is what's leading the mind to enlightenment. So here, this isn't about like, ah, uh, I completely agree with every last thing the Buddha ever said because somebody who uh, is in the first stage of enlightenment would not have yet explored every last thing that the Buddha actually said, but they will have experienced enough improvement to the condition of the mind and they will know those core teachings well enough that they will have removed their doubt about whether the Buddha was actually fully enlightened they will have removed the doubt that the teachings that they are currently learning are in fact leading to improved 
condition of the mind in their life, they will have removed doubt that the community that they're practicing within are practicing the straight way, the upright way, the wholesome way, these virtues that are dear to the noble ones. They will have eliminated doubt about their individual teacher, whoever they're learning from, that that teacher has indeed helped them to get to the point where they are experiencing those jhanas in the first stage of enlightenment. And they will have eliminated their a, a doubt about their own ability to attain enlightenment because they would have had to put together a number of teachings in order to experience the jhanas in the first stage of enlightenment. They would have had to dedicate a lot of time, effort, energy, and resources to getting to that point through their meditation practice, through practicing generosity, through cultivating things like the Brahma Viharas and others to really get to that first stage of enlightenment that they would have no doubt that they have the capability to attain enlightenment. They haven't done it yet. They haven't seen all the teachings and they don't necessarily know how they're going to necessarily do it a hundred percent, but they will at least have no doubt. They will have confidence in their own ability to attain enlightenment. Um, I heard you mention the word disbelief. Um, so would it be accurate to say that it isn't doubt which uh, sort of um, initiates um, an investigation, um, but it would be either uncertainty or disbelief? Yes, so a person who has confirmed confidence in the teachings, they're confirmed, they have confidence that it is these teachings that are leading to enlightenment, but they haven't confirmed every single teaching in order to get to enlightenment. So they, they have no doubt that this collection of teachings is what's leading to their improved condition of their mind, but they wouldn't necessarily have confirmed every aspect of the teachings at this point. So that's why someone who's in the first stage of enlightenment might not quite understand the cycle of rebirth fully 100%, and they haven't necessarily observed their past lives, but they at least know that this collection of teachings is leading to their improved condition of mind. So you might need to still confirm certain aspects of the teachings, but you will have removed any doubt that it is this collection of teachings that is improving the condition of your mind. And also, I'm not sure how to phrase this next question that's in the mind, mm -hmm. but would you have fully eradicated uncertainty um, in a teaching in order to arrive at understanding with clarity the truth of the teaching? Um, it depends on how we dissect the language you're using there because you're using some really great language. Uh, so someone that's removed doubt, they will have something like they will understand the five aggregates. They will understand the six sense bases. They will understand dependent origination. They would have confirmed that these things are indeed the truth. But in terms of practicing it to a level where they've eradicated ignorance, for example, they haven't done that yet. But they at least have uh, independently verified these teachings to the level of detail that they know that they are in fact the truth. That a living being has the five aggregates and that's what makes a living being and that these six sense bases are craving and clinging and longing through these six sense bases trying to have these pleasant feelings to uh and there's this central desire that the mind is uh, experiencing through these six sense bases and they will understand the dependent origination in those 12 steps but they will not have mastered the practice of that yet so they still have central desire, for example, but they at least know that it, what that is and that they're working to improve that. Okay. Um, yes, I, I think I understand what your, um, what your message is here. Um, I think that there's a, there's a strong um, need to have a gradual process in uncovering what is um, the truth for your, for oneself um, based on practice and diligent practice and um, experiential um, uncovering of the t what is the meaning behind the teaching. So I think that um, in regards to figuring out if you have eradicated 
100% doubt or disbelief or uncertainty. I suppose one would um, one would sort of say in summary that it's not something that can just instantly be eradicated from the mind. It has to be something that is led to gradually. Exactly. That's 100% truth. And what the, these first stage of enlightenment is doing is it's kind of setting you up to make the rest of this journey. It's kind of like base camp, right? Like if you were going to uh, go to the summit of Mount Everest, you would have had to pack up a whole bunch of gear and you would have had to learn a whole lot of things to pack up this gear and make your chart off to get to base camp. And when you've gotten to base camp, it's like, all right, I've got everything I need here. I've got all the supplies. I've got all the equipment. I've got the knowledge. I've got the wisdom. Now I just got to make the rest of this journey to get to the to the summit. And uh, that's essentially what the first stage of enlightenment is, is it's base camp at Mount Everest, that you've got all the supplies you need and you know it's going to be a challenging journey even from the first stage of enlightenment or from base camp of Mount Everest. You still got a lot of work to do to get to the summit, but you've at least got all the tools that you need. So if you've eliminated doubt about the teachings, you've done things like having confirmed confidence in the Buddha, the teachings, the community, you're practicing moral conduct, you've got these five aggregates, the, the, the six sense bases, so you understand central desire, you are uh, understanding dependent origination, you're not going to be causing harm that would lead you to being reborn in the lower realm. So you've, you're at base camp and you're ready to make the journey to the summit of Mount Everest at this point. And that's what the Buddha is really setting you up for here by eliminating these first three fetters. Okay, thank you for that, walking through that. Um, we'll go to Nick next. Yes, sir. Um, given the, the book we're studying in the series, today's class, stream, stream entry, um, I think it would be good to, to um, go over the, the first three fetters, which, which is what uh, is needed for stream entry. Um, we've got to eliminate those first three fetters. But previously and earlier in class, I think we covered number three with with the question that I had, and I learned something today, um, how to look at the Eightfold Path part and, and wrong grasp of uh, behavior and observances. That, that's, that's very clear. I have a new perspective on it. Um, Manal just covered doubt, and in and, and your explanation, I have a new perspective on that. Um, I'd like to just go over the first fetter, which probably is the most difficult, I would say, for a, for a large majority of people. Um, the personal existence view, the way I see it is that, that that's the ego. I know I learned a lot about that in Thailand. We've, we've been over it. But uh, maybe if you'd be so kind to reiterate some things and just a general overview, just to cap off the class. That'd be wonderful. The way I understand personal existence view, um, it's the idea of knowing non-self. You know, that's covered in volume one. Um, the idea of non-self. So having having an, an understanding of that, uh, a realization of non-self, like stop being selfish. You know, think of others. Um, you don't need to be craving and have greed towards you. And the personal existence view, I'll use myself as an example, like I shouldn't uh, be walking around, oh, I'm Nick, uh, you know, I was an army commander, or I'm a purple belt in jujitsu, I'm, you know, I'm this, I'm that. And, uh, you know, uh, the idea not to do things like that, identify yourself, you know, You're identifying to the, that'd be identifying to the five act or gets, I believe. And also, the way I understand personal existence view would be elimination of uh, craving um, to be perceived another way from others. Um, can you just tell me if I'm in the right uh, area and if there's anything you would add and just to clarify this and, and what's the best way to eliminate the first better? Yeah, you're looking in the right direction, Nick, but you're confusing the personal existence view and you're adding in some of the fetter of conceit so this is good that you're asking this question so we can clarify it 
So personal existence view is part of the ego, but it's not the entire ego because conceit is part of that. So personal existence view and conceit are what we describe as the ego. And this isn't a idea, this is a teaching. So we don't think about the idea of non-self or the, or the idea of personal existence view. It's a teaching, it's a fetter, it's a pollution that we need to deeply understand and penetrate and be able to see really clearly that what this personal existence view is, is it's clinging to the five aggregates, right? So it's that form, feeling, uh, perceptions, volitional formations, and consciousness. Uh, more specifically, the form aggregate and the consciousness aggregate, aggregate. This is where the mind falsely, mistakenly believes or has a misperception or a misunderstanding that this physical form or this self-image is the self and this is who I am, this physical body. And now because of clinging to this form aggregate, the mind now becomes discontent related to impermanence of the physical form. The changes, aging, you know, uh, different aspects, trying to project a certain self-image. Or if you hear somebody say something about the self-image, you might become discontent as a result of it. And you're trying to project a certain self-image in the world. The other aspect of personal existence view is the self-identity. This is the clinging to the consciousness or the identity that's in the consciousness. Like you mentioned, like I'm a jujitsu instructor, or I'm a pilot, or I'm a uh, a husband or I'm a father and I'm trying to be the very best father not just trying to be the best father because you would like to continue to make efforts efforts to be a good father but trying to be the very best father and I want to be identified as this amazing father to everybody in the world and have a certain persona and a certain identity that the mind is clinging and holding on to so what you'd like to understand is personal existence view that it's the self-image that, that's associated with the physical body and the self-identity associated with certain qualities of mind that one is trying to project into the world. And in order to eliminate personal existence view, a practitioner needs to disassociate, needs to let go, needs to eliminate the clinging to the form aggregate and to the consciousness aggregate. And the way that you do this is through changing the way that the mind thinks about this physical body and about the certain identity that is in the mind that you deeply understand that this is not who you are as a person. And instead of saying, you know, my body or uh, my clothes or my phone or my son or my girlfriend or my house, you start thinking about it as this is the place where I live or uh, this is a device that I use for communication, or this is a computer that benefits me in being able to perform certain tasks rather than my computer. Because when we hold on selfishly to all these things, then the mind has the ability to then experience discontentedness. So when we let go of the self-image and the self-identity, realizing that this doesn't define who we are, this physical body, it can be skinny, it can be fat, it can be old, it can be ugly, it can be young, it can be uh, healthy or unhealthy. We can have an arm or we can have an amputated arm and be perfectly content no matter what this body looks like. Now, of course, we make efforts to maintain our health and ensure we're healthy, but if we happen to have a stomach, then we're okay with that and, and we might make efforts to improve our health, but we understand that having some fat here and there as we age is part of impermanence and we don't uh, feel discontentedness because of that. Or if we see some wrinkles or some gray hair, we don't, uh, you know, become discontent because of that. Or if someone uh, looks down on you and thinks that you're the most horrible father that's ever existed, you don't uh, feel <clears throat> uh, diminished because of that, uh, because you understand that that's identity and holding on to the identity of being the very best father is just going to cause discontentedness so you no longer try to cling and hold on to these self-identity that's in the mind so therefore if you're not clinging to the form aggregate or the consciousness aggregate 
i.e. the self-image or the self-identity, then these things can no longer cause you any discontentedness. So you can let those go as part of personal existence view. When you were talking about I am, I am, I am, this uh, relates to personal existence view, yes, because it has that self-identity, like I am a Brazilian jiu-jitsu teacher or I am a father. But there's also a certain amount of that that the Buddha relates to as conceit, where we take on this persona of I am, I am, I am, and that's where the arrogance and the pride comes in. So the I am is part of the self-identity, part of this personal existence view. The arrogance or pride of the I am is the conceit. So if you can let go of clinging to the form aggregate and the consciousness aggregate, then it's also much easier to then work on letting go of conceit or this arrogance and pride as well. And then also the judging, measuring, and comparing and looking down on others as being inferior or looking at yourself as being superior uh, or looking at yourself as being inferior as well. Because if there is no self, then you're not comparing and measuring yourself to others. So that's where these two are, are really connected and need to be worked on so almost simultaneously. But it really does help the practitioner to be able to see personal existence view as just self-image and self-identity and being able to see conceit separately as arrogance, pride, judging, measuring, and comparing as being superior or inferior to others. And when you've eliminated both personal existence view and conceit, this is where the ego is completely eliminated and dissolved and the mind can reside much, much, much more peaceful and then you'll also see that your personal and professional relationships will really blossom because nobody enjoys being around a narcissist or somebody with uh, egotistical tendencies. Nobody enjoys being around that person and because the, these pollutions of mind, of personal existence, view, and conceit show up in our intentions, our speech, and our actions and other people can feel it. So when we eliminate this pollution of mind, of personal existence view and conceit, then our intention, speech, and actions are purified more fully as well. And you'll find that your personal and professional relationships will be more wholesome and they'll blossom and be very successful because we're not walking around with this chip on our shoulder, so to speak. Thank you, teacher. One follow-up question. <clears throat> um, as far as uh, like self-image, say if you had a a date with a significant other, um, and you tried to, you know, um, have good hygiene, you know, I mean, you don't have to have tons of jewelry on, but if you just like like to put on a nice, clean outfit, you know, would that be all right? You're not, or is that projecting a self-image, just like trying to look good for a householder's occasion, like a, like a date or something? Yeah, it's not about the actual object itself of the clothes that you wear or choosing to maintain the health of the body it's not about that uh, what it's about is about how the mind relates to this like i'm going to put on these clothes and i'm going to be the man i'm going to i'm going to get this girl and i'm going to take her out and i'm oh i'm going to do this that and the other thing that's the part where the mind becomes diluted and there's this craving in there for certain selfish desires and now there's this arrogance and pride that comes along but if someone just humbly peacefully goes about maintaining the health of their physical body and they put on some nice clothes because they would like to be polite kind friendly and respectful and going out on this date and maybe even they wear a piece of jewelry or two and they're doing this out of uh, having a, a cordial relationship and, and presenting uh, themselves in a way that is polite, kind, friendly, and respectful in a humble way. So you can wear the nice clothes and take a good shower and put on jewelry and not have personal existence view. Or you could put on those same things and do all those same actions, but the mind is now diluted and there's this self-image and self-identity where the mind's all bolstered. And then when your date's like, oh, you wore that? And now the mind has these painful feelings. 
Or your date says, oh, wow, you're the most handsome man I've ever seen. And now all these pleasant feelings arise in the mind. So if the mind still has personal existence view and you've gone through those motions that you said, you know, taking a shower, wearing nice clothes and a little bit of jewelry, if there's personal existence view there, then when someone says something agreeable, there's going to be these pleasant feelings arise. And if somebody says something disagreeable, there's going to be these painful feelings arise. But someone could go through those same actions of taking a shower, wearing nice clothes and wearing uh, some jewelry. And then when they hear this agreeable and this or this disagreeable uh, comments, the mind still resides peaceful, calm, serene and content with joy, not allowing the pleasant feelings or painful feelings to arise for one who's realized non-self and has fully eradicated personal existence view their mind will just reside in the middle they might say thank you i appreciate your kind words you know that's so nice of you or whatever you might say to that person but the mind won't arise any discontent feelings either pleasant feelings painful feelings or feelings that are neither painful nor pleasant as a result of this self-image or this self-identity because those would be eradicated so it's not the actual action of taking a shower, wearing the nice clothes and wearing a little bit of jewelry. It's how the mind re what does it react with discontentedness as a result of agreeable or disagreeable uh, comments or does it reside peaceful, calm, serene and content with joy no matter what transpires around people sharing things related to your self-image or self-identity that should be eradicated if one has eliminated personal existence view. I see teacher David. I think a good example would be, you know, younger Nick in his twenties going on a date with, you know, yes. uh, compared to, uh, you, know, right, right, you know, listening to sharp dressed man as I'm getting ready, you know, something like exactly. that. Exactly. Compared, compared to how I would, um, you know, just go out now with Christina, you know, I'll just, you know, Look presentable, and she doesn't really care, like you know what I wear. But put on something nice. I see, I totally see the difference. Thank you for the clarification. Yeah, and this is where you can understand craving, desire, attachment as it relates to any objects, right? So, like a, a monk, for example, an ordained practitioner, they don't have a car. So people think that in order to get rid of your attachment, you have to get rid of the car. No, you don't have to get rid of the car to eliminate your attachment to the car or you're, you're, you're holding on your craving, desire, attachment for a car. You don't have to get rid of the car. You just have to eliminate how the mind relates to that car. So here, if you, you don't have to get rid of the nice shower, the nice clothes, and the jewelry necessarily. You have to get rid of how the mind relates to this. And when it hears agreeable things, the mind gets these pleasant feelings. And when you hear disagreeable things related to the self-image and self-identity, you have these painful feelings. So you don't get rid of the uh, taking care of the body uh, through a nice shower and through clothes, through jewelry. What you do is you get rid of how the mind relates to this. And when you realize non-self and you realize that these clothes are not you and you realize this physical body is not you and that these um, things that you are involved in are not you and who you are and that they're constantly changing, that you're not going to be a Brazilian jiu-jitsu teacher for, for permanently. It's not possible for you to do that. If the mind is clinging to being a Brazilian jiu-jitsu teacher permanently, then when you get to the point where you can't do that, now the mind's going to feel discontentedness because you identified with that so much. You felt like being a jiu Brazilian jiu-jitsu teacher is who you are and what makes Nick Nick. Now when you get to the point where because of impermanence you can't continue to do that, now you're going to experience discontentedness. But if you let go in the mind of realizing being a Brazilian jiu-jitsu teacher is something that you do, something you enjoy, something that you're contributing to, but you're not clinging to it and you realize that it's not permanent. Then when you get to the point where you're not doing it anymore, then your mind won't experience any discontentedness. So that's why by eliminating these first three fetters, the Buddha says discontentedness is limited or diminished because you've taken out many of the pollutions that are going to cause discontentedness in the mind. It's always craving, desire, attachment, but it's certain cravings, desire, and attachments that have been eliminated that the mind now experiences limited discontentedness. So we don't look at these objects and these activities and these tasks themselves as being the attachment or the craving, desire, attachment, but it's how the mind relates to them. Thank you, Venerable.
well, sir. You're welcome. So I think that's the. Oh, go ahead, Manal. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Teacher David. You I were saying. Do you have a question? Because I was I was going to say I think that's the last chapter, but you have some more questions. I was going to wrap things up. We we have a question from Amina on Facebook. Sure. Uh, awesome. Can read that if we if we'd like to do that. Wonderful. Well, Amina writes. Uh, does dependent origination lead to understanding that there are no happen chances nor accidents? For example, if I trip, that is not an accident, but perhaps because I was attached to looking at my cell phone while walking and not being present in the moment. And should we remove the concept of accidents from the mind? Uh, the first part of your question, yes. So dependent origination helps you to see causality. It helps you to see that everything you experience is a result of your decisions. That's that volitional formations or choices and decisions. And our choices and decisions are either based in ignorance, along with craving anger and ignorance, or they're based in wisdom, or that generosity, loving kindness, and wisdom. And when our decisions are based in generosity, loving kindness, and wisdom, they produce wholesome results or wholesome outcomes. When they're based in craving anger and ignorance, then as part of dependent origination, we see that they result in unwholesome uh, aspects of, of life. So yes, to that part of the question, yes. In terms of, you know, should we remove accidents from our vocabulary? There are such things as accidents in terms of, of uh, uh, of you, you, you would have liked to have not done certain thing, but the way you're thinking, yes, I agree that there are no such things as accidents. These are all choices and decisions that we make. That if we get in a car accident, it was something that we would have preferred not to have happened, uh, but because the mind wasn't performing uh, in a certain way uh, or perhaps someone else's mind wasn't performing in a certain way, that there was this accident. So we are going to still be using that word accident, right? Because of things like a car accident. We wish this would not have happened. That's kind of what an accident is. is we really wish this would not have happened. But since you're starting to understand that there is no such thing as an accident, it's all based on choices and decisions, that's where you definitely would like to point the mind and understand that, yeah, there is no such thing as accidents, but we are going to be using this word uh, in d conversations with others. Just like we say, this is my daughter, right? Because you have a daughter, this is my daughter. And you're going to need to say that to certain people. But your mind knows and it practices that this isn't my daughter that I'm going to hold on to her so tightly. So we oftentimes are using certain words in our vocabulary and conversations with others, but our mind deeply understands that there is no such thing as accidents. And we understand that this isn't my daughter, but we still use those words in conversations with people because it just makes the conversation flow because other people don't have the same wisdom that you're that you are acquiring as part of this path. So therefore, you need to kind of use this language in a way that other people can relate to and understand what you're sharing. So if you said, you know, this is the being that I that came out of the birthing canal 10 years ago, people would be like, what is this lady talking about? So it's easier to say, oh, this is my daughter, right? So uh, the answer to your question with the word accident is a bit more deeper that you're right, there are no accidents. Uh, everything is happening for a reason based on our uh, causes and conditions, based on this cause and effect or these action and results. Uh, but we will probably need to use that word occasionally as we talk with various people, depending on what the topic of conversation is. Parekshit has a question. He writes, Venerable Sayor, in AN, there is a sutta that says, Recollection of a deity leads to dispassion, cessation, to enlightenment. So, does recollection of a deity is different from worship of a deity, which is mentioned in lower fetters? 
you'll need to send that to me uh, so that I can look at it closely because uh, sometimes the translations that we use from other places are not as clear and crisp as the translations that I use. And sometimes there's uh, discourses that uh, are, are people think are part of the Buddhist teachings, but they're not truly part of the teachings because the Buddha didn't teach uh, rites, ritual, ceremonies, or worship of any deities whatsoever. Uh, so if you're seeing something that talks about that, it, there's a very good chance that it's either a, a translation that isn't 100% accurate, or at least what I would consider to be 100% accurate, or it might be somebody who's attributing a certain discourse to the Buddha, but it's not actually his words. And the Buddha gave us guidance on this, and he said that when we compare discourses to what he actually taught, that we should be able to see the truth and that if we see a discourse doesn't match to what his teachings are, that we can ignore and disregard that discourse. So if you'd like to send that to me, I can look at it more closely and provide you guidance. But just from what you've read, I wouldn't be able to do the investigation to determine. But it sounds like there's a very good chance that that is not something that the Buddha shared because we don't worship deities and we don't recollect deities in order to improve condition of our mind. It's through the acquiring of wisdom that we uh, improve the condition of the mind and get to enlightenment. Thanks, Tisha. No more question. All right. Well, I think that this was definitely a, a very a wonderful session of deeply learning and diving into these teachings with you guys. Uh, I can see that you guys are really coming along now. And we're only in the fifth volume of this book series. You know, we started uh, several months ago and we're now have studied volume two, three and four, uh, just really penetrating into volume five. So that means we've really only been through three of these volumes and we've got uh, many more to investigate. And you guys practice is really coming along. I can tell by the way you guys interact with each other, the way that Manal did a wonderful job in moderating and very politely and kindly interacting with each other. You guys uh, practice is really being able to be seen, at least I can see it more and more clearly. So thank you all for your dedication and it shows that your practice is you know, really coming along and that must mean that you're uh, paying a lot of attention to these teachings, both in class and outside of class, really developing the Eiffel Path, focusing on your right speech and uh, all the other things that are part of this path to enlightenment, including meditation. So continue to develop your practice, continue to develop your life practice, because not only do you need to get more and more content and peaceful interacting with each other, but also interacting with others who aren't on this path. It's really easy to have this practice with people who are on this path and you're interacting with a being who just like you isn't interested in causing any harm and who's practicing right speech and right action and all these other teachings but where the real test and the real challenge comes to your mind is interacting with people who aren't on this path and who are argumentative and who are using harsh speech and uh, who do have a lot of craving, anger, and ignorance. That's where the real challenges and the real tests come to your mind. And you don't want to just seclude yourself and stay in isolation where you just shelter yourself and no longer interact with people who are not on this path. Because sometimes we can get so absorbed into our own community that you just spend time around people who are on this path. You'd like to make your way out into the world and spend time around people who aren't on this path so you can learn how to interact through these teachings with people who aren't on this path that's where the mind becomes very challenged and you actually get to test the mind therefore you get to improve your practice because you start trying needing to try to figure out how to practice these teachings with people who do have large amounts of craving anger and ignorance and that can be really beneficial for your practice so uh hats off to you guys for your determination your dedication and your diligence and my words here are really just to encourage and motivate you and support you to continue your journey because your improvements are surely uh, observant in the way that you guys are asking questions and also in the way that you're interacting with each other so thank you guys for your dedication to your practice 
Next week, we're going to be studying the next 10 chapters. So we'll be in chapters 31 through chapters 40 of this book. So you can read them before class and or after class if you like. Tomorrow in the group learning program on Sunday, which we're going to be covering chapter 15 of volume one. This is the chapter on true love. This is a really important chapter to learn and understand because the Buddha didn't really talk, at least in terms of what we have in the Pali Canon, much about true love. This is teachings that we know are part of the path to enlightenment, but they haven't really been captured in the Pali Canon in a way that we can actually understand them directly from the words of Gautama Buddha. So now it's important that in this lifetime that we deeply understand this because Practicing true love is so important for our relationships and it's a area of our practice that oftentimes is misunderstood and it's one of the most misunderstood parts of life in our life practice and it's one of the most challenging aspects of our life practice to be able to learn and cultivate and practice because as household practitioners we have relationships with our parents, with our friends, with our children, with loved ones, that we need to understand how to practice true love. And it's chapter 15 in volume one that will explain that to us. And I'm gonna be sharing more about that and give you guys chances to ask questions about that. So even if you've been in that class with me once or twice before, it's really important to learn that and uh, really be sure that you penetrate that teaching uh, with wisdom and really understand it and start to practice it more and more. It really will help your relationships blossom. And then in Wednesday's class, we'll be doing breathing mindfulness meditation. So I'll see you guys either next Saturday in this class or perhaps in Sunday or Wednesday's class as part of the group learning program. We'll see you in a future class. Have a really wonderful and lovely rest of your day. We'll see you next time. Sawadee Thank you again for watching. Enjoy your meditation. Look forward to seeing you online and answering any questions that you might have. Thank you so much.